everybody this time of year, you know, it's spring ball, and which means I look at who are you returning, who did you have to replace, and there was a period of time where I thought if I come to Tennessee and I'm talking to coach, I may be talking about them replacing a bunch of really important pieces. Then all of a sudden you have some really key guys come back, and, and guys like Cooper Mays may not be on the front of magazines, for example, yeah. but that and a number of other pieces is – obviously a really good starting point for you. Yeah, he's a guy that probably should be on some of those uh, covers, but, um, you know, our veteran guys from last year that had an opportunity to make a decision on, on the back end of the season, what was the right move for them in their future, um, getting some of those guys to come back for the right reasons, their development, their experience, um, trying to make a career out of it at the next level, uh, continue their development on and off the field is hugely important to you know the roster and and uh, what we're going to have out on the field uh, next fall and and uh, it's been great because you have a lot of leadership from last year that actually came back um, that's been really important for our new guys that came in in January them getting ingrained in the culture of the program and um, you know really a, a big reason why those guys have transitioned so quickly on the field too here as we've uh, as we've wrapped up spring ball uh, but really excited about that group in particular at the line of scrimmage uh, you mentioned Cooper on the offensive line um, a lot of those guys are back um, on the defensive line have a lot of experience coming back as well so there's all kind of perceptions out there about every team every coach every program or whatever so there are some that exist about yours and sometimes the perceptions are true. Other times you, you dig beneath the top layer of soil and you find out, oh, that's a little bit different. So the one I want to ask you about is you got a high-profile quarterback in Nico Imaliava that came in here. And so he's kind of the first wave in like the NIL, NIL generation of high-profile players. Yep. Well, there's automatically a stigma that goes along with that of, well, if he's a, as a highly prioritized commodity, it probably comes with this attitude and this built-in diva mentality. Yeah. And then you walk around the building mm -hmm. and talk to people on or off the record, and they say, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the antithesis of what that guy actually is. So you coach him. You see him every day. What's he like? Yeah, uh, pajama pants as he was going through the, the <laughs> seven-on-seven circuit that, that everybody sees. Um, but he's a guy from the moment that, that he's come in here. Uh, he's humble. He works extremely hard. Obviously, he's uh, really talented. Um, but he's a guy that goes and grinds every single day inside of our building. That's in the weight room. Uh, it's in the meeting room. Um, it's continuing to grow in his craft. Obviously, as a quarterback, the leadership's got to continue to grow. Uh, I love the steps that he's taken in you know, the first 16 months that, that he's been here. Um, but that's a guy that you know, embodies a lot of the right things inside of our program. And um, you know, just his continued growth as a person since he's gotten here and as a teammate. Uh, been really fun to, to have him be a part of the fabric of this program. And, and uh, you know, he lives it and does it right every single day and um, had a great spring. Uh, really excited about his growth from, you know, the first start that he got in the, in the bowl game, um, how intentional he's been since he got back on campus and uh, continuing to play at, a, at an elite level. You ever surprised mm -hmm. that guys are that advanced? in terms of maturity or mentally, you played that position. Yeah. You played it at a high level. You played it in an era that was prior to the one he plays in. Yeah. So when you talk to guys like that when they're 16, 17, 18, yeah, they, they check the physical boxes, yeah. and very few of them check those boxes. But then to also check the mental part of it, it's got to make you breathe a sigh of relief, like, well, I actually don't have to deal with the baggage. Yeah. Well, I think that's really important in the recruiting process that you figure out who they are and their maturity because they are having to balance things in a completely different way than you know previous player generations have that have gone before them. You know, I've had conversations with Nico and, and you know flat told him like I wasn't mature enough at the age that you are to handle it the way that you have. Um, and uh, there's so many things that he's got to balance. Um, he's known everywhere that he goes. That's you know inside of, of Knoxville and, and across the state, but really you know throughout the country and and uh, as an 18, 19 year old, that comes with you know different expectations and um, you got to be really mature, not just in the building but outside of the building as well. And and it's one of the things that I really love about him because you know he prepares and handles himself outside of the building in a really good way. And and um, you know those are things that we're intentional with as guys transition into our our program 
helping them get started immediately in the right direction. But that also doesn't just come from our staff, that comes from our players inside of our program. And you know, you're talking about Nico, you look at that quarterback room and the connection that those guys have had. Um, even though there's typically one guy that's playing and you're constantly competing within yourself, but with the guys in the room to become your best, the way that our veteran guys have been able to pay it forward to, to the guys that are coming back in, uh, in behind them. You look at Hendon and Joe's relationship, Joe and Nico's relationship. Um, it's one that, you know, there's a lot of camaraderie in the room. They continue to help each other uh, on and off the field, deal with everything that comes with playing the quarterback position. I don't think the outside world believes that that would be the case typically. If you're in a highly competitive environment, maybe someone watching this right now is in that at work and yeah. the dude two cubicles over yeah. is like outselling you in one quarter or another quarter. The thinking there would be cutthroat, let me go after it by any means necessary. And yet in this world, you've got individual goals you want to obtain, but it's also collectively, it's a team game at the end of the day. Yeah. So you've got guys in a room and you only got one starting spot for him in the quarterback's yep. case, and yet you've got to have a mentality where one guy bleeds into another guy, bleeds into another guy. Like, do you do you think it's understood how rare a commodity that is to have outside football? It really is. It's rare outside of football, but it's rare inside of a, of a program too. That that doesn't exist everywhere um, because it is highly competitive and guys have you know individual goals of what they're trying to accomplish during the course of a season where they want to get inside of a game long term um, and uh, so it's rare that those things exist and, and that's the culture that we've built inside of our program where veteran guys welcome the new guys into their room and are pouring into them it, it, it can't just be coaches coaching players it's got to be player to player too and and you know, I talked about the, the, the quarterback room a, a minute ago, but, you know, you look at our veteran defensive linemen with the new guys that have, have come in on the interior, on the edges, you know, how they pour in and coach those guys on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I made a, a point inside of our, our team meeting after I had sat in the D-line meeting just how intentional a guy like Elijah Sim and Omari Thomas are in pouring into their young guys after a coach gets done coaching up the play too. And, you know, a great example of that is Brew McCoy at the wide receiver position who's coming back off of, of injury. The new guys that have come in, transfer uh, freshmen, whatever it might be, him being an integral part of helping those guys grow within our system. When we started getting into this new era, um, call it the NIL era if you want to, there were these wild swings in philosophy about what it was going to do to the sport. Yeah. And one of the things that some people latched on to is this will automatically divide locker rooms all across the country. And then case by case, we've seen it happen here. We've seen it not happen there. My theory was if a, if a place is easily fracturable, it will, it will only exclamate that. And if you've got a solid culture, then you may not have to worry about it so much inside your building. How have you seen kind of that new era affect your locker room? Well, it is, it is a different era. Um, and in some ways, a locker room resembles, you know, what the NFL looks like more than college football ever had. Um, but at the same time, <clears throat> for the most part, within the college football, guys are still looking for the same thing. They want to be developed. That's inside of the game. They want to grow as men. They want to have fun in that competitive arena as well. And so what the players are looking for really hasn't changed with the caveat that there's you know another layer to it within the nil landscape and at the end of the day i can go back to my playing experience if i was a player and i had the opportunity uh, to partake in, in nil i surely would have wanted to have, have taken part in that as well but i think that's why the culture really matters um, the growth of the person the reality that your players know that your coaches care about them as human beings not just the player and continuing to help them grow within the game as well you're around young people on a day-to-day -day basis not everyone who watches this is most people who are 30 40 50 years old are not yeah. around 17 to 22 year olds every yeah. day so there's this inclination sometimes whenever they see the younger generation have an attitude or do anything they don't like it's just this generation man throw up your hands well you're around this generation every day number yeah. one you couldn't react that way if you wanted to <laughs> yeah. but number two 
What is your perspective on that, working with kids on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I think uh, young people and players, young players, want the same things. If they can see themselves growing, they know that the person cares about them, um, you know, that's the experience that they're wanting while competing and having fun doing it. Um, they want to be connected to their teammates. The locker room, the energy, the experiences still matter. Um, and uh, uh, at the same time for, for players, um, it's important that, you know, that they're growing outside of the game as well. So um, to me, um, they haven't changed as far as what they're actually looking for. This generation, because information is everywhere, I think for this generation of kids, but for human beings in general, they want to understand the why. And if they understand the why, then they can go about it. Um, you know, previous generations probably just did what they were told because they thought that that was the best plan and the only way to do it. Um, this generation wants to understand the why. If you explain the why really well, they'll buy into it. Another misconception that when I have our stats and info department print me out the numbers is right there on paper, but is not out there in the general public is what your offense is. Your yeah. offense, if I asked a random guy, Carl, on the street here, is just, yeah. well, Heupel, Where's Heupel, Carl at uh, right well, now? So Carl's yeah. here, casual Carl is his name. It's, Heupel just throws the ball all over the place. It's just a shot offense. And then I, I print out the numbers, yeah. and you guys are like over 2,500 yards rushing every year, yeah. and I know it's not garbage time numbers, so like, it, Talk to Carl through me. What is the Josh Heupel offense at Tennessee? At the end of the day, uh, we're trying to take advantage of what defensive structures are, are giving you. Uh, we want to put our guys in a position to create big plays. That's in the run game. That's in the pass game. Um, you know, for us, it all starts with the run game. Uh, if you look at us historically, um, you know, Coach Ellerby, our offensive line coach, and I have been together for uh, going on eight years now. Um, the secret to the sauce is the run game. Is there a different style running back you look for, maybe more so than if I just ran a traditional pro-style offense, characteristic, characteristics that fit your offense? Man, it, it, it's it's kind of like the quarterback position for us. Um, we've had small um, you know, guys that you would assume are out in space, but you know, guys that got elite track numbers uh, that may be a smaller body type, 185, 190 pounds. Uh, we've had guys that are in that 220 uh, range. Um, you know, a guy like Jalen Wright that uh, you know I think led the, the the conference and I believe the country in yards per carry. Um, you know, so we've had different body types. Uh, for us at the running back position, you got to have guys that um, you know can play without the ball in their hands. I think that's really important to typically young guys got to develop uh, that skill set, um, but have great vision, great pace, understand how to use the guys in front of them, uh, can reduce their pads, um, have, and each back's going to be a little bit different in how they do this, but have a make you miss component. And, um, you know, the last thing that you uh, want is uh, a guy that can hit the home run too. I thought probably one of the quieter things that started happening here I noticed it last recruiting cycle and then this past one as well is you guys were recruiting I think better than people realize defensively and then you look at like the defensive line depth here yeah. and there are other places in the country that run these really high octane offenses that struggle mightily on that side of the ball and the personnel is not there yeah. and you guys I, I say quietly I know it's not quiet in the building but I think outside the building yeah. quietly maybe you've you've upgraded the personnel on that side yeah. And the developmental side is there. And a lot of the first things that come out of people's mouths when you're in this building are defensive players, defensive coaches. So like, walk me through what you guys are defensively. Yeah, for, first of all, our defense staff, Coach Banks, and, and our defense staff have done an unbelievable job of developing our players, developing our system, continuing to grow, um, but being aggressive in, in what they do. Uh, you look at when we first got here as a staff, um, you know, I think before we got to spring ball, or uh, while we were in spring ball, I think we had 56 uh, scholarship players. Uh, we were hit with the portal in that month uh, of dead time uh, before we arrived, and um, in particular, hit on the defensive side of the, the football before we arrived. And so, you know, patching our roster, uh, finding ways to, to continue to grow within uh, the players that we had. Um, they did a really good job, but you know, the last couple of years we continued to take big strides. Uh, you look at where we rank within the conference, tackles for loss, sacks, uh, 
leading or at the top of, uh, of the conference in both of those categories. And so the continued growth within our roster, recruiting at a really high level to have the body types and athleticism that we want within our, our defensive structure, and then continued uh, developmental growth uh, of those guys technically. I really like the direction uh, of where we're going and anticipate us again taking another big step uh, this offseason. But you look at us schematically, uh, we're aggressive, we're going to bring uh, pressure, we're going to play in a lot of different fronts, mix our coverages. Um, defensive guys get exposed to everything that they need to for this level, but also for the next level to go put themselves in a position to make a career out of uh, uh, playing this game. You mentioned something, and it kind of took me back in my mind to how I felt when you first took the job. And every guy inherits whatever he inherits. Yeah. But it's normally just limited to what's my roster. You guys had some extenuating circumstances with NCAA, and so I'm yeah. looking at that. I'm looking at the roster attrition, and I remember just like thinking, how, how long is this going to take him? <laughs> like, what, what, I mean, how long until I can reasonably judge him just based on wins and losses and not have to say, yeah, but? on the back end of that relative to how bad it could have been yeah. there's no yeah buts here at tennessee you better you better go win yeah so i i said it <laughs> yeah. i said it on the outside yeah. I, was, I was outside state lines yeah. when i said it. It, it relative to how bad it could have been yeah we've now fast forwarded three years and i'm looking back and i'm like wiping sweat off my brow kind of crisis averted and now you kind of pull the nose up and you feel good and it's your program now and there's not there's not this thing like lingering out on the horizon yeah. anymore how much more freeing is that man it's it's changed the way we're able to recruit uh, our communication um, you know from when we first arrived here um, the outside noise obviously completely different uh, with everything that was going on before we got here and and um, maybe that first summer that we were still battling through um, you know and I'm saying that from our athletic department with uh, with the NCAA um, now people have tangible evidence of, of where we're going. I say that on the field um, and, uh, and off the field. And so it allows us to, to go and uh, recruit at a really high level and continue to, to upgrade our roster and continue to push forward. When we got here, you know, now it's unlimited as far as the number of bodies you can bring in. At that time, you were limited to 25 throughout the course of a calendar year. Uh, I thought we navigated that space with all of the roster depletion that we had. Uh, extremely well and that only happens because of our staff and um, you know how we were able to uh, to move our players forward and the connection of our players within this uh, this program how hard is it or how challenging is it when you're taking over a new program and then you have to build a staff and then maybe you would have built it the same way anyway but you built your staff knowing those unique parameters were in place yeah. When you're in a staff meeting and you look around that table and then the outer perimeter or the folks sitting behind those yeah. folks, how long before it takes you to look around and go, yeah, I think I got the right collection in this room. Like, I think we can navigate this. We do have the right collection. Uh, I, I say that now. I felt really strong when we first got here. We were intentional in who we brought in. Um, when you hire somebody, you want them to have the same uh, perspective and global view of how you're trying to impact and grow young people and young players. Um, being committed to a connection uh, is a huge part of that and being elite teachers. That's why we built trust within our program so quickly. Uh, we're able to flip it in year one and uh, have had the su success that we have. So uh, I promise I'm going somewhere with this. So back in back when I was a kid, I had to stay with Meemaw every day yeah. before my parents came to pick me up after school. We would watch Rescue 911 on like Lifetime channel. So I remember an episode about smoke inhalation. And I remember thinking how terrible that must be. Fast forward to 2022, I'm here at the Bama game. Yeah. And it goes the way yeah. it goes. Yeah. And you're in the locker room afterwards, yeah. but I'm, I'm on the field. Yeah. It's outdoors. There's no roof on this place. And briefly, I got smoke inhalation because it was so thick, even on the field in an outdoor setting, that I remember thinking to myself, man, all these years later, this is when it hits me. Outdoors is when it hits me. Um, I know you're all about looking forward, and I am too. Yeah. But yeah. For, for about two minutes... Take me back to what that night was like for you. And it felt to me like a Berlin Wall moment of, of perception for people who had just come to think, uh, Tennessee, they, they, they don't do that kind of stuff anymore. And then all of a sudden they did. Yeah, I, I think uh, it only happens because of uh, the growth and the expectation from within the locker room. And I include the coaches in that to, to go play and win those types of games. Uh, that's the standard at, at Tennessee. It was a, uh, a Berlin Wall moment um, for us, and I say that in that, um, in that game in, 
uh, in 22. Um, you know, I walked underneath the goalposts as they were coming down. There's a great picture from across the river uh, that I saw when I got home late that night. I thought it was a doctored up picture with all, with all, the, <laughs> all smoke. the smoke. That is why you had the smoke inhalation uh, in that. But, um, <clears throat> you know, for us, um, it, was, uh, it was proof of the work and everything that goes in to be able to take advantage and go win in those moments. And again, I said it, it's the standard here at Tennessee. Um, we are looking forward and, and continuing to push forward. Um, we got, uh, got a lot of big games on our schedule this year, ready to go attack it uh, one week at a time. When you, when you have a tangible result like that, or you have like a 10-win season, just, just different benchmarks that fans judge you based on, yeah. I think you would hold yourself to a little different standard. You would hope people in the building are thinking in a little different way. But how valuable is that as like a little cherry on top of a validation of, see, I told you guys, we're, we're doing it the right way. Okay, yeah. now you see this. Now we're not where we want to be yet, but there's just a small little reward. Now, you could have orange and white confetti raining down on you one day if we continue to stack days like we are. Yeah, I, I think for us, the expectations outside of this building are extremely high. That's one of the things that I love about our, our fan base, um, but they're never higher than they are inside of this building. And that happens because of the way that our players work. Uh, they got great habits. I'm uh, really proud of what they did this spring uh, as an example of, of that. Um, it is a cherry on the top. It, it is a moment to reinforce the process um, that we go through as a program uh, throughout the course of the year to get where we want to go. Uh, at the end of the day, you can't sit and be in that moment. Uh, you got to always push forward. That's one of the things we talk about, success or failure from play to play, from week to week. Um, you got to wipe it clean uh, and, uh, and move on to the next one. And, and um, we're continuing to grow in that mindset and understanding um, as we get everybody's best shot every Saturday, um, us being prepared to go give our best shot too. If I'm following Tennessee football, especially in spring, I'm just going to like Vols247.com, did we get out of today healthy? Okay, good, that's a win. And you guys got out of spring pretty healthy, yeah. so that's nice. Aside from health, how do you judge how good a spring was? Man, fundamentals, technique, the growth of your players, that's in block destruction. Um, it's in uh, blocking out on the perimeter. It's, you know, tackling habits. It's understanding the fundamentals and scheme. Uh, guys being able to uh, play different positions, uh, figure out, you know, where we project them for the fall, but also having uh, position flexibility uh, as things unfold during the course of the season. Uh, for me, as much as anything, it's how intentional our players are every day during the course of, of the practice. Uh, we had great energy, um, you know, before every practice. Um, but to me, what I love is the competitive maturity of this group, being able to focus in on your job and continue to grow at it every single day. To be a professional at what you do, to go about it a different way, to be intentional about it, mm -hmm. is that one of the sharper learning curves for a freshman? And, and is it, therefore, that much more important to have veterans in the building that you can point mm -hmm. to and say, do it like he does? You go from being the only big fish in the, the pond, in the pond in high school, in your area or your high school, the teams that you play, being superior athletically pretty much every time that you walk onto the field, to being on the field and in a position room with a bunch of guys that have the same athletic traits as you. And so learning what are you willing to do to go above and beyond to get where you want to go, what are you willing to give up to help you get there, and then being able to be consistent every day in the meeting room, in the weight room, and then on the practice field. It is the growing curve of how you go from a young man, young player, into becoming your absolute best and becoming a pro. How often do you encounter guys who think they have that mentality only to then find out, wow, I got put in the deep end here. My feet are not touching the floor of the pool anymore. Like it's kind of a, it's kind of a shot to the senses. Some guys are lazy and know they're lazy. Other guys think they're grinding. And then all of a sudden you want me to work 40 hours a week. Like what's happening yeah. here? Uh, grind is a word that gets used too often learning what that, that actually looks like um, is the growth of, of every young player. And I can go back to myself. My dad was a college coach. I thought I understood. 
I got in the moment, in the arena, and I learned what that actually looks like. And that's the growth of every young player. And that's where coaches, you got to help them understand where they're at. What's the plan to move forward to get to where you want to go? What does that tangibly look like on a day-to-day basis? When you hire staffers, most guys from a work ethic standpoint check the box or you wouldn't hire them. Yeah. But aside from that, there's variance in that too. Yeah, you know, I mean, you better check on on what their work ethic is. How do you do that? Man, uh, you, you got to have uh, resources, guys that you trust. Um, a lot of times, uh, somebody that has a connection to them so that you understand the same things that we're looking for in our team. How accountable are they? Do they build trust? Can they communicate at a high level? And do they love and respect the process and, and care about young people? And do they attack every single day with everything that they got? When they grab that door handle, do they come in and compete to make themselves, their players, in the program better? And um, uh, so those are things that you definitely want to try and verify. You're probably in the time of year right now where you're ha- having like exit interviews with players yeah. and you're going over everything that needs to be gone over with them. Is there a process in place where you do that with your assistants? And how different does the conversation sound like with a a 45-year-old man who's coached the game for 15 years versus a 19-year-old who's played the game his whole life? I think it's important that you you do all those things with everybody within the structure of of your organization. You have department heads that, you know, may be in charge of your on-campus or your personnel, Um, them having intentional meetings with the people underneath them. I'm having a a meeting with those department heads, um, making sure that everybody understands, you know, this is where we're at. What are some things that I can do better? Where where am I falling short? But then also how do, you know, them and their department continue to move forward in the right direction? You've been able to go on the road a few years now in the SEC. and You played on the road in some big environments as a player. Uh, Walk folks through, especially in the SEC, going into some of these road environments and how... Uh, I like to call it unaccommodating. Some of, <laughs> some of the road conditions are. Yeah. Uh, what, what's that like? Yeah, um, road games are as real and as tough as, as you're going to encounter at any level of football within within this league. Um, you know, the energy, the noise, um, the venues are as good as it gets in football. Period. At any level, and you know, for a team to go on the road. And to be able to execute between the white lines, it really comes down to knowing your job at an extremely high level, but being able to have, uh, being able to clear from the whistle uh, to the next snap and uh, refocus. And um, at the end of the day, there's nobody outside the white lines that's going to impact the game unless you allow them to impact the game. And that's where the growth of your players um, and your staff, to be honest is really important. Uh, all the I's got to be dotted and T's got to be crossed. We talked about NIL and how much that's changed. So let's set that to the side for a second. Yeah. Go from the time you played to present day. What's the thing or what are the things about college football that have changed the most that make you look and say, I wonder how I would have handled that. Or I wonder how I would have thrived or failed in this if I were a player today. Um, I, you know, I think organizations have, have gotten bigger, um, you know, certainly within the, the, the confines of, of this league. And I, when I say that, that means there's a lot more resources um, for the players. You know, I was right at the end of the era where, you know, you weren't allowed to, to get, you know, a snack, you know, inside your locker room. Um, it's just so different. And so your players have every tool, every resource to grow to be their best uh, inside of the game and really outside of the game. Um, you look at you know player engagement, life skills, all the training that we do, uh, the opportunity for them to be ready when football ends, whenever that might be, um, has drastically changed. Um, you know the transfer portal obviously has changed the game here within the last last few years and um, the management of a roster uh, is completely different than, uh, than it was. The coach-to-player headset communication and also the new two-minute rule. Yeah. We see that, and it's a headline that makes you go, oh, that's interesting. You see it, especially as an offensive coach, and you say what? Um, 
you know, the two-minute rule, it's interesting that they implemented that, you know, a year ago. They, uh, you know, they changed the, the clock rule as far as the clock running, um, you know, in, in the middle of the, you know, first and second quarter, third and fourth quarter. So interesting that they did that. I think it's got a chance to change the way end of half are played a little bit. And, um, you know, you got to look at the NFL and, and how those things play out to, to learn and grow and, and be prepared um, for those things. So there's a lot going on right now that's outside of a coach's purview at the higher just college football level, but it's going to impact you. And it could be anything from realignment to fundamental changing of rules. It feels like rules change every five minutes anyway. Yeah, How, you don't know they're coming sometimes. It's too. wild. It is. It's, <clears throat> you, there's an assumption on the outside that if I'm reading a headline today, coaches knew this was coming long ago. And yet you talk to coaches and you're like, yeah, I found out about the same time you did. How... I guess frustrating may be the word because I'd be frustrated. But how frustrating is that? Yeah, sometimes you're finding out in uh, in middle of June. Uh, to be honest, you know, you might go into to conference meetings, things that were never discussed during the course of, of our conference meetings. That could be at Destin or uh, in February we go to Birmingham as well. Things that are never discussed get implemented. Things that you think are going to get implemented end up not happening. So. Uh, with everything inside of college football, um, you know, you look at how quickly NIL changed uh, at the drop of a dime in the middle of the summer uh, transfer portal. I think now more than ever within your organization, um, you have set parameters of how you want to operate, but you got to be extremely fluid and nimble on your feet um, so that when things come out, um, you know, you can shift into uh, what's best for your organization. Everybody has opinions on all this stuff. and. Any any time we talk to coaches, off the record, they're they're happy to vocalize what they like and don't like. On the record, nobody wants to be seen as complaining or whining because at the end of the day, you just got to do your job given yeah. the circumstances in place. But if coaches who are by far the most knowledgeable on all this aren't speaking up, other voices get heard. And so, like, how, how in the world do you? walk the line of making sure an informed voice like yours gets heard in the room while also making sure it's understood. I'm not making excuses. I'm just telling you there's maybe a better way to do things than the way we're doing them right now. Yeah, um, you know, I already touched on like NIL. Like I, I think in a lot of ways that's a real positive for, for college football players. I can go back to my my playing days and, and um, certainly would have liked to have take, taken advantage of those things. So. Um, I think, you know, in the general landscape of college football right now, um, some of the things, playing rules, for example, um, you know, coaches' voices aren't being heard. And it's not that they're not being voiced, um, you know, just how college football is aligned, who's in control of what. Um, I think some of those things just, uh, you know, aren't heard or, or get muted. So when you, it's kind of a hard pivot here, that's why I paused. When we come out of spring, okay, there's, there's, it's just focus on football now. What were some? Of the, I wish that were actually. Well, yeah, I wish that were actually true. That's what I was about to say. Yeah. I said football, and yeah. I wanted to air quote it. Right. But, but so, this is the time of year where you're post spring, and the public has nothing to do but talk. You got nothing but time on yeah, your hands. It's, and then, ta it's talking season. You go right to now. media days, yeah. and that'll yeah. be. So that's going to consume yeah. everyone else's attention. Yeah. What are you doing in the building that is? behind the curtain no one's seeing it between now and the next time we see you which will be I guess in Dallas this year yeah uh, first of all our, our coaches are on the road head coaches can't go right now so um, you know you're getting uh, feedback on on what's going on on out on the road uh, having the uh, opportunity to continue um, to look at you know what you're recruiting uh, in this class and, and to be honest in, in future classes as well so that's um, Primary right now at this time of year, you know, as a head coach, uh, head coach, organizationally, you're making sure that uh, all your plans, you know, from summer to training camp, um, are ready to roll. So when uh, when all your coaches get back, um, they're ready to hit the ground running. Here's one thing I've always been curious about: if I were a head coach, especially if I can't be out on the road right now, and my staff yeah. is, I would want minute by minute updates on how a visit's going with a kid. Um, that's not practical. It's, so it's not because of the coach on the right, road. I've right. been that guy on the road, minute to minute. That is not not reality. So what's let's say I am your running backs coach, yeah. and I'm in I'm in the school of a top running back on your board today. How soon after I shake the kid's hand and walk out of the school and I'm headed back to the airport 
Are you getting feedback from me? Am I being debriefed? Or is it when I get back to the building, next staff meeting? How does that work? Um, it's not when they get back to the building. And, and I say that just because, you know, you look at the structure of their timing being on the road. Um, you know, some of those guys are, are out for three weeks. And whether or not they're back on the weekends can, you know, be predicated on, on where their next trip is. So uh, we try to make sure that we wrap everything up by, by the end of the week and, and have intentional conversations. All right, so we exited spring. We're pretty healthy. We got a, a big season coming up. What were some of the things that you may have emphasized to your staff and your team before they kind of left you post spring is these are the things that are going to determine what happens to us this fall? Now, first of all, this time of year, uh, because players have a little bit more time on their hands, being smart decision makers and make sure we're not on any headlines. Uh, you can do a lot of things this time of year that uh, inhibit and eliminate the opportunity for you to be a part of what's going on uh, by the time we get to summer and or uh, training camp. So uh, that's paramount constant education of, of those guys. Uh, this time of year, uh, lifting for us, a uh, great opportunity to, to add mass uh, to our frames, make sure that we're ready to roll when we get back uh, at the beginning of summer. Uh, they report back after Memorial Day. Um, those things are paramount for your young players, opportunity to digest what just transpired uh, throughout the course of spring. You know, you have your winter where you're leading up to it. Uh, they're out on the field trying to go execute within your scheme. A lot of young guys can really grow during this time. Uh, anticipate all those guys growing throughout the course of the summer. They should be a different player. They should be a vet by the time they hit training camp. And uh, making sure that we're putting our guys in a position to kick off the summer the right way. Josh Heifel, we appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. Thank you.